Good afternoon and good morning, depending on where you are at the moment. My name is Lance Mercereau, Chief Marketing Officer at Roslyn Analytics, and I would like to welcome you to our webinar today on how you can create more business value from data using analytics. I am joined by a well-known HR expert, Dr. Max Bloomberg. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Lance. It's wonderful to be here. Excellent. Well, thank you for joining us. We have set some time to answer uh, your questions at the end of the webinar, but if there is anything urgent, please send your questions during our time together, and we'll do our best to answer them. So let's start. People are the most important asset in your company, yet it's largely untapped. We're here to discuss and show how you can create more business value and opportunities by understanding more about your people. It sounds like a lofty idea, but there are numerous examples of how companies are using analytics to better know their employees. You will learn today how to use analytics to answer questions that will benefit everyone in your organization, including yourself and your colleagues. We would like to start today with a one-question survey, just like today's Brexit does in the UK. We will release the anonymous findings at the end of the webinar. But please send your answer by messaging us the letter of the answer most applicable to the question, what is your biggest challenge to deploying analytics? We've got uh, A, B, C, D, E, and F. We'd love to hear your thoughts on what are your biggest challenge to deploying analytics. So again, we'll show this later on uh, in the webinar at the end. It isn't easy to be an HR professional today. This slide with research from PwC shows a number of key metrics that are all going in the wrong direction. The return on your workforce investment is declining. Employee turnover is going up. And employee diversity, frankly, isn't improving. And these are just some of the key metrics that many HR organizations look at. What are you to do? Good question. I'd argue that you need to have more insight into your people to overcome these and other pressing issues. And that's where data and analytics play a big part. So to address the challenges highlighted in the previous slide, it's not surprising that HR teams are embracing HR analytics. According to Sierra Speeder, a US-based research firm, the adoption of analytics by HR teams is hovering at 39%. That's great. However, I believe from what we are witnessing firsthand, this number will easily hit or exceed 75% within, within the next 18 months, simply because HR teams need to better understand their people and data is key to creating that insight So everyone's talking about data and analytics, and quite a bit of people are talking about what is a data-driven organization and what is not a data-driven organization. Well, here, again, from Sierra Cedar, it highlights what is the difference between HR teams that use analytics and those that don't. Well, it's a lot, frankly. The behavior and characteristics are successful data-driven organizations access more data from more systems, apply more metrics to base decisions on, and most importantly, actively promote the adoption and usage of analytics to a far greater number of people in their organization. Now that's really, really powerful. And so here you can see, for example, again, the, the data sources. Um, for a data-driven organization, it's 4.9 
versus the non-data-driven organization 2.7. Um, and that has an increment, a, a material impact for HR organizations to drive value. Now, analytics is not easy, and a key aspect of creating value from analytics is data. However, and this is really, really important for everyone to understand if you haven't already experienced this, um, the biggest analytic challenge facing HR professional is not the lack of data. I mean, frankly, we're all surrounded by so much data. It's actually the lack of data uh, aggregation. It's, it's bringing together many different sources from within and external of your company so it can be analyzed in one place. That, in, in other words, is breaking down those data, 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 those data, data silos. So to put this into perspective, Gartner estimates that 90% of an organization's data is not accessible by employees. This leaves only 10% that is accessible. However, half of that data can't be used because it's not of, of quality. And of the remaining 5%, well, it's not being managed by employees, so it loses its value too over time. So what does this mean? Well, it means that HR professionals are making some serious decisions using a small percentage, percentage of the total data. This isn't good to say the least. This lack of data doesn't provide the required information or insight for you and others to know your people better and to know your business better. I'd like to hand over to Max now, who will go through the, some common obstacles to analytics. Thank you very much, Lance. Yes, I, I'm particularly interested um, in the point you made there about how little of our organization's data we, we tend to use. Um, and, and I think that's probably not true, uh, not only true of HR, but across the piece. So when you look at the amount of data available to the financial function and to the logistics function, there's so much data that we can start bringing into our models, which could help us achieve our organizational objectives uh, more succinctly, more effectively. Now, I'm going to talk about four particular challenges uh, related to analytics, but I don't for a second believe that these are specific to only HR analytics. I think they apply to all business functions. But we're going to talk about them today in the context of people analytics. So the, the, the four that we're going to look at are the, the hassles associated with integrating multi-source data, um, the limited analytic skills that we uh, experience within, uh, typically within HR functions. Um, how does one build a business case? Uh, analytics is not always the cheapest thing in the world to do, uh, even if the returns are huge. How do you convince other people of that? And finally, if you are convinced that analytics is the right way to go, well, where does one start? There, there seems to be an infinite number uh, of possibilities. So let's start by having a look at uh, some of the issues around integrating multi-source data. The primary issue here, and I've uh, taken some of this uh, from, from Josh Burson of Deloitte, um, is that you can think of the data available within HR as belonging to three categories. You've got people data, which might include the demographics, the job experience, the performance, etc., of the people. But HR is about, is about applying programs to your workforce, to your people. So there's a lot of data, efficiency data, if you like, uh, which comes from your recruitment, training, uh, perhaps engagement, retention, succession planning, and so on processes like attendance data, uh, adoption, uh, completion of programs, performance management, and so on. Then you have the pure performance data, which is a very thorny area, as we all know, uh, within HR, which looks at things like the performance rating and are people attaining goals, etc. Now, the big issue here is 
Um, are there objective goals, for example, f if you don't have a profit center or if you're not in sales? Um, it's very difficult to come up with objective measures for support or administrative or HR or marketing roles, for example. Now, if you consider that huge swathe of data and you've got people like myself, uh, analysts, telling you that there's so much you can do with it, the real value comes when you start combining that with all of the operational and financial data. So we're not recruiting people for their own sake, and we'll come back to this in a second. We're recruiting people because we want to improve the effectiveness of the operation. We want to improve our financial and our marketing outputs. So really, when we talk about integrating data, we're talking about combining all of the people data with the rest of the organizational data. And when you're sitting in HR, that is a really tricky job because traditionally uh, that data might belong to the business function that we're talking about or it belongs to IT and how do you gain the access? So what a lot of companies do, and you might find that you're an example of this, is we analyze data within HR. So we look at engagement and we look at retention and job performance without necessarily linking its impact to wider variables. So um, let's move on to the next slide. And so the challenges associated with that are typically um, integrating the data consumes more resources than analyzing the data. I, I think back to most of the projects that I've done, certainly pre uh, let's say 2012, 2013, before we had the likes of Roslyn's um, and Workdays and Oracles, etc., which brought data into one place. I, I can categorically say that three quarters of our pr time on a project would have been spent just bringing the data together, uh, and a relatively small amount of time was actually spent analyzing it. And I think for many companies, that's probably still true today. Another challenge that I think many of us experience is that although many of the vendors of uh, uh, analytics products uh, tell us that they're easily customizable to whatever our business context, the fact is that it's complex. Customizing tables and changing things, particularly in the large well-known brands that I won't mention here, um, it's really difficult uh, to try and change those uh, so that they can fit for the information that your, your organization requires. The third point is that most analytics tools, I find, tend to lean either towards reporting or towards analysis, but seldom are they very good at doing both. So if you look at a tool like Business Objects, for example, just to choose one at random, uh, great on reporting, uh, great on OLAP, on slicing and dicing, but very little ability to look into the future. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at a classical um, a statistical tool like um, SPSS or SAS, for example, uh, fantastic on doing the analysis, but you need to be a bit of a geek uh, and a bit of a techie in order to use it. So you. One of the issues is uh, when you're trying to integrate this is finding a set of tools that can meet both your reporting requirements and also meet your analytical requirements. And then the final major challenge that we experience when integrating multiple multi-source data tends to be the lack of consistency in metrics definition. So for those of you from fairly large organizations, and I see we've got a few here today, uh, you know what it's like when Asia Pac uh, and the states define performance or retention differently or engagement differently. How do you add together data that isn't even defined consistently in the first place. So these are some of the challenges we have as HR when trying to bring together multi-source uh, multi, uh, data. So um, what are some of the solutions for addressing these issues? Well, at the very highest level, I would strongly recommend creating common metric standards across the organization. Now, most of you have probably done this by default because you need to. Um, as usual, there are bound to be a couple of outlying uh, parts of the organization that refuse to uh, have their data conforming. But if you look at uh, another project with which I'm involved, uh, along with the CIPD and CMAN, the Chartered Management Institute, um, valuingyourtalent.com is a free framework 
for defining most of the metrics, if not all, hopefully, uh, that you would need to do your analytics. So if you're part of a large organization, uh, it's open source, you're welcome just to grab any of the definitions you need. The second thing that might help is when you are choosing your tools for doing your analysis, think very carefully in the first instance about interoperability. And what I mean is, is it likely that if you buy tool A, how easily will it work with tool B? So for example, if you buy a reporting tool, let's say a Cognos or something, is it easy to get the data out of that and into uh, an analytical tool like SPSS. This is assuming that you're not using Workday, uh, etc. But even if you're using an Oracle or a Workday, you need to think very carefully about how easy is it to move data from one system to another uh, for the purposes of analyzing uh, and how complex are the table structures. Uh, and then finally, uh, another uh, solution to the integrating uh, multi-source data issue is think about how you intend to use uh, the findings from your analytics because that might give you a bit of a clue as to what sort of tools you'll need to use. For example, if you've just started out along the analytics road, you don't really want to be doing deep predictive or regression analysis. Probably what you're looking for is relatively straightforward reporting of the data, if for no other reason, so that people can come back to you and say, we think that that data is inaccurate. So if you are in reporting mode, as you probably should be for the first while, don't go into the market and spend a fortune on systems that provide machine learning and very deep analytics until you're over that first hump. So that's the first challenge, is uh, integrating multi-source data. The next challenge that we usually come up with uh, as HR folk is the business of structural and skills issues within the organization. The first question that we look at here is to say, well, who actually owns people data? Now, the logical question to that is, surely it's got to belong to the business. I view HR as the custodians of people activities and the people data. But the ultimate accountability and responsibility and ownership of that data must lie with sales and with the operation and with logistics and with the business itself. The role of HR is to advise and provide consultancy, but the data belongs to those people. So that's the first issue when people say, well, you know, HR owns the data. That surely can't be true. The next issue that we face, and I uh, mentioned it a little earlier, is this business of data silos. Um, for very good reasons, your operational and your people data are kept separate. I probably don't need to go into that here with, a, with, with so many HR professionals uh, on the webinar, but there are good reasons why they're kept separate. The question is, what are the security uh, hubs that you need to go through to be able to do useful analytics? As I said earlier, if you want to do analytics which works out how to improve employee engagement, you could probably find all of that data within the HR function. But if you want to understand what is the impact of employee engagement on our profitability, you're going to have to start bringing operational data in. And to me, that is when HR analytics starts becoming really useful and really interesting, is when you start bringing in the operational data. Bear in mind, we're not in business to engage our employees, or not only, and to uh, retain our employees. We're in the business of producing so many widgets, of providing so many services. If it turns out that engaged, retained employees help towards that, then of course we should be measuring engagement and retention. But the real role of analytics for HR here is to show the impact of engagement and retention on things like revenue and productivity and sales and so on. Data silos make that very difficult when it comes to bringing that data together, and we'll have a look in a second at how one addresses that. One thing to bear in mind is that if HR doesn't own uh, human capital analytics or HR analytics or people analytics, um, who is going to own it? So although the data clearly belongs to the business functions, I argue strongly that unless you as HR people, assuming most of you are HR people, unless you as HR people 
grab ownership of that data, you can be sure that your finance function is going to say, look, HR are not doing much uh, with the rich data available for analysis uh, to help us make better people decisions with all of the money that we're spending on people. Um, finance is going to take over the uh, an analysis of people data. So. A very important point is that if HR doesn't own the analysis of the data, someone else will. So we accept that other people own the data. I strongly believe that HR needs to own the analysis of that data. And finally, um, the analytical skills issues. Um, it's a fact that in the last 10 to 15 years, people who've joined human resources functions have not joined because they want to be quantitative analysts. Most of them join because they like working with people, they may fancy themselves as psychotherapists and you know, want to get the employee out there on the, uh, on the couch to try and do a bit of analysis, perhaps that's a little extreme, but you get the idea. You don't generally join HR uh, because you want to do quantitative type work. And so we're in a transition now where we're starting to see as Gen Y come through the workplace um, that they tend to be more quantitative and of course HR functions are consciously trying to recruit a different type of HR employee. And I must say I'm very uh, pleased uh, when I look around HR functions with the companies uh, that we work with to see the number of different types of people coming through. I think to some measure this is encouraged by the number of people coming out uh, with MBAs, number of employees with MBAs, uh, and also um, the number of CEOs with MBAs. Uh, sorry, not that I'm necessarily a fan of the MBA, I think it's a great thing. Um, it's just that when you do uh, an MBA, you're forced to do a lot of quantitative analysis. And so naturally people who've come through that route, and particularly CEOs, are going to start insisting that their HR functions uh, join the quantitative part. So those are some of the issues structurally and skills-wise that we face uh, when trying to do people analytics. So what are the ideal skill sets that you're looking for when you do this? I see this as being four different types of uh, skill. Now we can debate afterwards whether these belong to one person or whether each of these form a team. Uh, it will be interesting to hear your views on this. Uh, You'd certainly need the ability to aggregate uh, and collect high quality data. I can't think of a single project where we haven't needed somebody on the project who understands the value and importance of bringing data together. If you hate bringing data and you hate data, analytics is not the job for you. So that's the first thing you need to check. Do you have somebody who actually likes that? You could say, let's outsource that to IT, but the fact is IT will be looking at your data without any real meaning. It's only HR that can look at training spend and say, gosh, the reason spend went down uh, is because uh, we, we closed a plant or the reason that spend training spend soared so much uh, is because we introduced a new product into the market. Truly, IT can't tell you why the data is moving around. Uh, moving clockwise around the circle, the ability to analyze and make sense of data uh, and relationships. That's a big story that, uh, and, and we'll look at that in a second, but it's not the isolated data that's important, it's its relationship to other data. Let's go back to the example we said earlier on. A lot of companies proudly say that their um, engagement, for example, rate is uh, 75 or 80 percent. To me, that figure is fairly meaningless unless you can relate it to the extent to which the organization is achieving its objectives. What if I were to tell you that a company whose, enga uh, whose engagement, for example, is very, very low, around 40 percent, is actually getting much closer to its objectives than a company with much higher engagement? You're then going to come to the conclusion that, wow, engagement isn't nearly as important as all of the consultants who sell engagement told us. So it's the ability to look at how data relates. Does an increase in engagement lead to an increase in profitability? Um, does f more flexible working hours uh, lead to greater retention amongst our female employees? It's that desire to see relationships between metrics that makes a really good analyst. Um, 
the next thing is the ability to connect. The ability to connect is so critical. I've spoken a couple of times about silos uh, and about how the data uh, belongs to the business functions. If HR is going to make analytics work, it's absolutely crucial that whoever's in HR needs the political nous, the political skills, the people skills to be able to bring together teams of people uh, so that they want to work together, so that sales actually wants to help HR work out what are the best kinds of people for recruiting for sales or what is the best kind of training that one might need. Typically. HR and sales, for example, may not share the best relationship in the world. If that were true, you need to start recruiting people, or we need to start recruiting people into HR that are able to form these kind of business relationships that might require a greater understanding of the business in part, but it's also the ability to connect multiple functions. And then finally, there's this, the red circle the ability to take a consultative approach to analytics. What I mean by a consultative approach, um, and I think we've got a couple of consultants uh, on the call today uh, who would agree with me, it's the ability to find out what is the real problem faced uh, by the client. So there's a tendency for us to roll out competency frameworks uh, all over the organization or roll out performance management systems and to roll out analytic solutions when actually we haven't found out what is the real problem that our customers are experiencing. So for example, we might say the problem in manufacturing is that the people aren't trained properly and HR might go out uh, and promote some kind of new training when actually the real issue in manufacture is that the technology is out of date. Um, and what we're trying to do is fix it with the wrong problem. A consultative approach would be to start with the end in mind, with the problem in mind, and say what is the problem and how does people, how do employees, how does the workforce contribute to that problem, if at all, and if it does, then start building a solution. Okay? Moving on. Now, building an analytics business case is very interesting. A lot of people that I speak to say that they really believe that people analytics is what they need to be doing in the organization. But as soon as you give them a price, they jump out of their chairs and they have a heart attack. Um, there's no question that people analytics does deliver significant returns. Um, but the investment to achieve those returns is not insignificant. For example, I worked on a project and I think the total cost of the project must have been in the region of uh, 300 to 400,000 uh, pounds. Um, I think it's pounds and not euros, but I'll confirm that tomorrow. Um, the return on that project was easily measured in the 80s or 90 millions. Now, if you do the ROI on that, 90 million minus, say, half a million, it's almost an infinite ROI. How do you convince somebody before you start the project, however, that it's going to be done? And that is the issue uh, that people uh, need to wrestle with. The problem is, as the second block says there, is that HR outputs are usually not expressed in financial terms. Uh, we normally talk about things in terms of engagement uh, and retention, maybe productivity, but we don't talk in financial terms. So that makes it very difficult to create a business case because a business case is code for financial, isn't it? So how does one address that? Well, there are two primary ways or a couple of ways that you can address that. Next slide. One way to think about it is this, and I think those of you who've seen uh, some, of our, uh, some of our work in this area will recognize this diagram. Um, what we say here is that looking at the right hand side, you're only running people programs such as recruitment and training and succession planning in order to achieve organizational objectives. 
I can't think of one organization that would spend money on recruiting someone or training someone if it isn't to achieve an objective. So in the very left-hand box, what we say is we spend X dollars, X pounds, whatever, on a program, and that is to achieve certain organizational objectives on the right-hand side. Now, how do dollars turn into objectives, as it were? The most popular theory is that those programs help you to get people that have got the competencies, skills, and knowledge that your organization needs. If they've got those competency, skills, and knowledge, they will provide the performance that you need as measured at the annual performance appraisal. And if everybody's getting the performance that they want, you should be achieving your organizational objectives. Now, that may sound really easy to say, but for those of you who are analytically inclined, what I'm saying is that if you were to have these as columns in a spreadsheet, one column uh, with program, another column with the competencies of your people, the next column with your performance, and the next column with uh, contribution to organizational objectives, what I'm saying is that there needs to be a significant statistical correlation between those columns, and that is really easy to measure. I would be very surprised whether many organizations are actually doing something as simple as seeing, is there a correlation between competencies and performance? What's the point in improving the competencies of your people if it doesn't lead to a corresponding increase in employee performance? And what's the point in having stunningly high employee performance if it isn't doing anything for your organizational objectives? Although it sounds silly when I say it like that here, if you look at your data or data in many organizations, it's absolutely true that the correlation between those columns is really minimal. It's that correlation that helps to build the business case. If you can show that currently in the organization we've got a very low correlation between competencies and performance, let's just work with the middle two, if you can show that by increasing competencies by 10%, that it in results in a 10% increase in employee performance, and you can translate that performance into a dollar figure, you've started creating a business case. And that's the general approach that we use. Another approach is slightly more controversial. Uh, for those of you who've been in the game for a while, you'll know the Kirkpatrick model. Uh, I'm not going to go through it here, but I would strongly uh, recommend uh, you to look at uh, Phillips's book uh, called Investing in Your Company's Human Capital for one of the most fantastic applications of Kirkpatrick, which I know is very out of favor, um, and it's not always easy to implement. But for those of you wanting to build business cases, um, I think that the modified Kirkpatrick approach uh, is very useful. Moving on. Finally, where does one start? Uh, you're now convinced you've listened to various people talking about analytics or it's flavor of the month where you come from or somebody has said to you we need to start doing an, uh, people analytics because everyone else is. Where do you kick off? So most people accept that analytics is a good idea, but where do you kick off with? Well, the first advice that I would give you is always start with a real business problem. Don't start with an HR problem if at all possible. So don't start with an absence problem or an engagement problem or a retention problem. Start with a sales revenue problem or if costs are too high problem or with uh, anything that relates to the business. Orders are too late. Customers are unhappy. Start with something, if possible, that sits outside of HR. The next question is what I call the strategic versus tactical approach. What I mean here is that should you start with an enormous strategic initiative or should you do a couple of smaller tactical projects to get you going? As you can hear by my tone, I'm very in favor of incremental approaches. I don't believe in spending 20 million uh, on a huge system uh, and, 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 and hoping that analytics will fit into your organizational culture. Uh, start with a number of smaller uh, tactical projects. The criteria that I normally recommend for selection, ensure that there's a rapid payback, uh, ensure that uh, it's low cost what you're doing and that is possible. Focus on efficiency, i.e. cost uh, reduction rather than productivity. And finally, make sure that whatever you tackle is something that senior stakeholders really believe is a problem. 
uh, in your organization that is people related because if you meet resistance you're going to need senior stakeholder buy-in in order for you to make changes and Lance let's hand over to you to talk about creating business value from HR data well, thank you very much, Max. So, <clears throat> yeah, we're going to talk about a little briefly here um, how to create business value from your HR data so you're able to answer some very important business questions. Now, we, we work with HR professionals uh, every day, and we have collected a number of questions that uh, often come up, um, specifically of uh, how can you help us? And they often come to us with a particular question or issue um, they want the answer to. And this slide shows um, at a very high level by team those questions. Now, I'm not going to ask you how many of these questions you're able to answer today. Um, so don't worry there. But what I really wanted to do is really to show um, you know, data is invaluable to HR and not just for their own use but also helping colleagues in other departments answer questions that they want to have answered. So <clears throat> it's great to have a lot of data and we've talked a little bit about the challenges that organizations face in getting data prepped and, and ready for visualization and analysis. Um, we've talked about the questions that can be answered through data and analytics. The question is then, well, as Max pointed out, where do you start? Um, this slide, we want to highlight a typical journey that data goes through from, uh, from, a, from being in a system through the process of integration, cleansing, and enrichment, which is it's what we call the, the data preparation. Um, here, we there's a core team typically where you, you've got some uh, basic uh, HR uh, data and some questions. The core team, uh, here is the workforce strategy and planning team. Um, and then that, 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 that team centralizes and puts in a basis of data and analytics. Where you go from there really is up to you, to the issues and the challenges that you face. It could be comp and ban, it could be compliance or employee performance. Um, but again, here we wanted to say that analytics, and can't reiterate this enough, it is a journey. Organizations that look at analyzing all of the data and waiting until they have all the data ready and then they push it into an analytics tool, well, that is very costly. It delays time to value. And that's not what um, high-performing HR teams typically do. So here is a um, we've mapped out uh, based on some conversations with uh, some clients uh, a typical um, journey uh, by team. So we've talked uh, at, the, at, the, at the lower left-hand corner where you have go live. We've got the core workforce strategy and planning team. They've got some, some basic questions that they want to have answered. And again, where you go from there, it could be anything from, okay, how do I uh, um, reduce um, uh, attrition? Um, moving forward to uh, employee performance halfway up, is how satisfied are my employees? Uh, it, it, these are some questions that definitely need to be answered. But again, it, it, it's a journey, and every organization is different and is unique as an individual. Um, but I would suggest and, um, from, a, from a, a recommendation is that every organization should develop their own HR analytics journey or their roadmap, um, looking at the data, aligning that to the HR and the business objectives uh, in order to deliver value uh, for themselves and for their colleagues in other departments. So here we're going to talk just very, um, Max and I have um, come up with a few recommendations um, for you on how to create value. We've covered quite a bit of this uh, already, but if you were to put it into five bullet points uh, succinctly, um, here they are. In particular, you know, I think the first one, Max would agree, but you know, you want to answer some questions, well, you need the HR data, the people data. 
and you've got to get that in shape so it can be used. And the key thing here is that often uh, HR teams by themselves or with IT support often spend 80% of their time preparing that data so it can be used. Um, what's really important is to, is to reduce that, of course, become much more efficient and ideally to flip that time spent on data prep so that 80% actually is on the analysis and delivering value. Max, what's your view on two? Number two, um, start with a small set of data and show business value. Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a very good point, Lance. Um, I, I think in general, finding the right set of small data is going to be the key thing for the organization. Um, I, I'd almost say what you're looking for is a problem that doesn't require a huge amount of data to solve initially. So there's some skill there in looking around the organization for problems that are unlikely to require you to, to build an, an enormous data mart. One thing that you can do, I guess, is to start with the small set of data that you have um, and give it to somebody quantitative to look for those all important relationships between for correlations between the data. We call that data phishing. Um, and if you're just starting out, while it isn't the ideal starting point, uh, it may be a very useful uh, way to get going in your organization. Excellent. Well, thanks, Max. And uh, number three, get as many people as possible to use analytics in your organization. Um, we find, and this is the survey that um, some research that uh, CS Theater already pointed out, that um, very well-performing HR organizations have many people, not just a few people, using analytical tools. Um, now, of course, it depends on the maturity of the organization and their level of skills and capabilities and uh, openness to sharing these tools and, and the data. But if you're if you're new to HR analytics, obviously you want to build a, a, a core analytical capability, um, and over time build out a center of analytics excellence. But again, that takes time. And it really should be driven by what you're trying to achieve, the questions that you're trying to get answered um, over time. Uh, if I just add to that a bit, Lance, is <clears throat> this concept of self-serve uh, analytics has been floating around for a long time. Today, I still believe that, for the most part, analytics is owned by a couple of geeky type people in the organization, whether they be in HR uh, or marketing. I think a true hallmark of analytical maturity is where every manager uh, has had some kind of training in how to use a tool. In other words, to go beyond just looking at a dashboard. Um, not because you're trying to turn everybody into a quant, but because you want some indication that management in your organization are starting to think uh, using evidence-based thinking. Uh, when you start getting that sort of culture where people start doing their own analytics, it might be as simple as doing a couple of graphs, uh, and just to think what is the meaning of the pattern in this data? Why is our spend going down? Why is absence going up? That to me is a hallmark of maturity and I've never seen an organization uh, where their analytical maturity has improved that hasn't done better as a result. And I agree, and I think that goes to, to points four and five, because to succeed, there has to be a collaborative culture, which is also related to, to point five, is be open to failure. Um, data and analytics is not easy. Um, it requires support. It also it requires encouragement from the senior management down, but also the courage of mid or um, uh, the, the, the people at the, at the coal face of doing the analysis. Um, there also needs to be, uh, in terms of the support and encouragement, um, a almost a culture of risk taking because analytics is all about success, but to succeed, we often say that to succeed you've got to fail fast. It's eliminating what you don't know or eliminating something that actually wouldn't actually help us move forward faster. And that's really important that, um, I think as Matthew, you pointed out, from a, from a self-service and from a, from a culture, you've got to build the skills 
you've got to have the right tools, um, but you've got to have that supportive culture um, that's also open to, to trying things new. Because often for many HR organizations, as we've seen with 39% of HR organizations adopting analytics, this is new territory for them. Uh, and just to add to that, if I may, Lance, um, is that analytics requires cultural change. I think Lance uh, alluded to the point really well there. There's no question that if you try and force analytics into a culture that is not analytics friendly, um, you're going to end up with failure and everybody who said, I told you this won't work here is going to be proved right. Um, there are many instruments, many interview techniques, many ways to establish what the organizational readiness uh, for analytics is. Uh, which gives you an idea with what kind of analytics. There are great surveys you can use and it says you need to start with reporting or you need to start with uh, graphing, you need, et cetera, et cetera. So think very carefully about what is your culture ready for in terms of analytics before you just run headlong into it. Excellent. Well, thanks. That's, that's very good, Max. That's very good insight. Um, I'm conscious of time. Um, I'd like to go back to the the question that we asked everyone earlier, and here's the result. So the question was, what is your biggest challenge to deploying analytics? And there were roughly uh, six um, answers, and um, the uh, answer that everyone was leading with is D. The main challenge is lack of skills to set up and run analytics. Um, Fascinating. Again, not it is, and but it's also interesting looking at the um, at the results, Max. That closely behind uh, is letter E. Can't make the business case for analytics, and I think that is. And you've touched on that, Max. And I think that's. Um, I think what we all need to do again is is, is helping HR professionals um, justify and make the make the business case to their to their colleagues because HR analytics is such an important asset. Um, yeah, so I, just yeah I mean, I've been, I find it, uh, that, and I really appreciate people coming in with that. Um, I, I've said for some time, uh, in fact, if you, if you look at my LinkedIn profile, I, I, I think I actually say there that training in workshops uh, like this and then getting more advanced is, is critical for HR people, far more so than bringing in a consultant to actually do the work. Um, I think that analytics is one area where it really does pay organizations to skill up. Um, uh, which is why we tend to offer a lot of workshops, a lot of training, a lot of coaching. I, I know we've got a couple of people um, on the webinar today uh, amongst my clients where, where I provide coaching for people uh, and I strongly recommend that approach. As far as making the business case goes, um, I would say that that Philip's book, How to Invest in Your Company's Human Capital, is a great read uh, and if anybody has any particular questions, you're more than welcome to come and chat to Lance. Uh, or I. Uh, there are specific models like the ones that uh, we showed there, um, but there are structured approaches for doing it. So just, just looking at some questions that have just come in, uh, Max, I think this is a good question, perhaps um, maybe you can help shed some light, is we have an issue with retention, reducing retention. How would you advise us to use data to tackle that? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, the first thing I do in a retention case is I do a lot of interviewing and a lot of talking uh, to people in the organization uh, and if possible people that are leaving to get a sense of what are the kinds of factors uh, that make people leave. Do they have something in common? Are they of a particular age, a particular gender, a particular ethnicity, uh, for example? So you're trying to find out about the people. Then what you want to do is to start asking people in the teams uh, what are the kinds of reason? What you're looking to do is to build up columns in a spreadsheet, one column for each kind of reason, um, and then to score each of those reasons, then take a particular individual. So, you know, Fatima uh, Smith left um, how would we score her on the age, demographic, uh, relationship with the team, whatever the things were that we were told causes it, and do that for a large sample of people, and then go to your local friendly uh, statistical analyst and ask them whether there's a relationship between the factors that you've been told impact uh, 
retention or attrition uh, and the actual attrition figure themselves. If there is, you're already halfway to building a model. Building retention models is not terribly complicated. It just involves speaking to people and finding somebody who can do a little bit of statistical modeling for you. Yeah, that's very good. Thanks, Max. Yeah, sure. Um, while we answer, why don't we do one more question here. Um, this is an interesting question. Um, would you hire a data analyst first or would you look at an analytics tool? <laughs> what do you think on that? Uh, well, it's an interesting question. Um, who's going to operate the tool if you don't have an analyst? So the implication there is that you're looking to buy a tool that is really simple, um, so simple that perhaps you could just get anybody to operate it. That's probably really good. If your organization has not done uh, much analytics to date, then probably a tool simple enough for somebody without specific analytics training to use is not a bad way to go uh, so that you can get a feel for it. My sense is that you're soon going to outgrow the tool um, and without a doubt within a year or two you are going to have to employ a data analyst. So if your question is really code for saying how do we set out on the analytics journey, do we buy a tool or employ somebody, um, I would say buy a tool, don't spend more than a, a grand or two grand uh, on buying that tool. Um, and play around with it, see what you get out of it. Um, you might find some interesting stuff. I, I think that's a really good recommendation, Max, especially with technology nowadays, um, especially in the business environment, that's actually it's becoming increasingly closer to consumer-like. So yeah, yeah. Uh, there are technology solutions out there that are uh, perhaps not free, but low cost, or, um, but high value, that uh, can be easily deployed um, that are cloud-based. But you're absolutely right. I, I think you, you, you've got to try and experience and test the market out um, as part of a start on the analytics journey. With Roslyn um, Technologies yourselves, Lance, um, to what extent uh, is the are the tools available to, to any user in the organization? Are there security levels or are, do you tend to recommend use by particular groups of user? Well, that's a good question. I think it really depends on the organization and where they are in the maturity of using analytics. If, it's a, if, it, if the organization is first just adopting analytics and so they've been typically using, let's say, Excel to do their, their visualization and their analysis, uh, they probably have uh, that, um, that uh, analytic capability to, to going toward a, uh, a more sophisticated or next step in the analytics journey. In other words, to get more value out of the data using um, well, more, more, more sophisticated analytic tools. I think that's brilliant. Um, but again, if, it, if an organization is, is well beyond that and it's really looking at doing some advanced analytics, such as looking into the future or, or the predictive analytics, well, that requires a completely different uh, I think, skill set that is needed to, to manage and drive forward and also to create and justify the investment in that technology, but uh, I think I think it's um, it really is unique I think, to to each to each organization. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, we're going to wrap up. I know there are a number of questions that have come through, and we will respond um, individually if that's okay. Uh, I would like to say a huge thank you to Max for your time and for sharing your vast experience and knowledge. Um, you know, it's greatly appreciated and I think this is really important. HR analytics is an important topic for the HR profession. It's been a great pleasure uh, and really, uh, really great to cover uh, interesting ground and, uh, and thanks uh, to people for the really good questions. Thank you very much. Speak soon. Speak soon. Thank you.